Can you hear me? Does this work? Okay, great. Um, so I was given two jobs. I was given a job that is uh, explain what fusion is and then what we're doing in it. Those are pretty big jobs to do in 10 minutes, but I'm going to do my best. So first, uh, what is fusion? Well, actually, start with the bigger context. So why fusion? So this is a graph. It's one of my favorite graphs. There's really three things you need to know. So this is projected clean electricity demand globally over time. The y-axis is gigawatts. Gigawatts are approximately gigadollars. So this is about $100 trillion. The x-axis is decades. This is a macro trend. It's the largest economic macro trend in human history. The different curves are all up and to the right. Everyone loves that. That's opportunity. All the different curves are projections by organizations whose only job is to make those projections. And they disagree. They're all up and to the right, and they differ by like a factor of four. And they differ because if you're at the top, you're a techno-optimist. You believe we are going to have new technologies that are going to make more energy to power our world, and we're going to stay below 2C. From the bottom, you don't think that's going to happen, and we're going to be at 4C. And so not only is this 100 trillion over decades, it's also the future of the planet, and we don't know. But the key determining thing in this is technology. Can you actually meet the insatiable demand that's going to come for clean energy to be consistent with life on Earth? Well, we actually know what the like, ultimate energy source is. The universe already picked it. So that's fusion. 99.9999, just keep going, of all the energy in the, in the universe is fusion energy. And what fusion energy is, is the opposite of nuclear power. It's the combining of the lightest elements into heavier ones. And in that process, releasing tremendous amounts of energy. Like, how much energy? Well, it turns out if you like, took the water bottles that, that are, are being passed, you know, passed out here, and you took just the deuterium out of the water bottles, you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't notice it was gone, and you put that in a fusion reaction, you would make enough energy to power your life for your entire life for everything you do. Your clothes, your house, your travel, your whole thing. You would never, never even notice it. In fact, that's why the sun can be 10 billion years old. Like, we used to, before we knew about fusion, we are like, oh, the sun must be 5,000 years old because it would burn out. It's made out of coal. It's like, no, the difference between 5,000 and, and billions is fusion energy. So fusion's a reaction. It's a reaction that doesn't take place on Earth, which is probably a good thing. Um, what you need to do is you need to build a machine, a machine that actually makes that reaction happen, that can reach the right conditions. That machine, there's different ways to do this, and there's a race right now to figure out what the right machine is. That machine would make the fusion reaction go and would consume basically no fuel, the fuel that would consume, everyone has access to. No uranium, no plutonium, no long-lived nuclear waste. Basically unlimited energy. That machine would produce heat. That heat you would put into an electrical turbine and produce electricity or power an industrial process. So that looks a lot like our energy system today, which means that it could scale really quickly. It could replace a coal power plant, for instance. So this is fusion overall. What are we doing at CFS? So CFS is the largest of the fusion companies. There's like 50 fusion companies now. So CFS is about a third of all the people, about a third of all the money. So about, about 1,000 people, about $2 billion. And what we're doing is we're developing a fusion power plant. That's what it looks like. This is a plant that would make about 400 megawatts of electricity. That's like the size of a large gas power plant, small nuclear power plant, coal power plant. That would be something that you could put in a community you could build it as a plant, uh, you could build it in a factory, move it to a site, and you would run it to power things. We're not yet building this, but let's say this existed. How would you address that curve that I showed earlier? Like, well, you build it in a factory. How many factories do you need? Turns out you don't need that many factories. And in fact, if you took one of the factories that make automobiles today, and you made the same number of automobiles as the key parts of those fusion machines, that would be enough to replace the entire energy system in 10 years. That's what it's like to go from energy as a resource, which is, it is today, where we, we go and we search for it, we gather it, we collect it, whether that's the sun, the wind, or oil, to energy as a technology, something that we make. So that's a factory. How much you know, fusion, the ultimate inputs are actually like steel. How much steel? About 1% a global shipbuilding of steel into a fusion ecosystem, fusion industry, would be enough to meet those curves I showed earlier. So this is the, the level of 
footprint that you talk about when we think about a fusion industry? What would that mean? Well, let's just take the, there's about 60,000 power plants in the world. Let's just filter them for power plants that are bigger than 400 megawatts. So like big power plants, type we're trying to build. 3,700 power plants around the world. Their average age is 28. They, they make 85% of the current electricity. 71% of those power plants are coal. The rest, almost all of the rest, are nuclear or hydro. They generate about $1.8 trillion a year, and they employ about 5 million people. So that's the scale of the market you're talking about, what you'd have to go and do. And this is currently growing like at a rate of less than a percent, but, and it's been doing that for like 30 years, but we're gonna need to go like five, six, eight percent. That's a big change in how you think about an industry. So we think fusion could address that. We're not alone. Other, this, that pitch, basically any fusion company could do it. The question is like, when will it happen what will it look like, and what are the, the milestones on the path to get there? So for us, what we do at Commonwealth Fusion Systems is we take the physics that we already know in fusion, I'll talk more about that, we combine it with a new type of other technology, a new magnet, it's a very high field magnet, you can't use gravity on Earth like the stars, you have to use something else, magnets can work. And then we're gonna build, and we're currently building, I'll show you pictures, a machine called Spark, a, a plant a prototype plant that will make more power out than in from fusion for the first time, like 100 megawatts, industrial scale, almost full-scale power plant, and then go build a commercial power plant, ARC, which is the one I talked about earlier. Where are we on the science of doing all that? Well, for fusion, that reaction to happen, you need three things. You need to be really, really hot. The x-axis is hot. How hot? Like 100 million degrees. Celsius, Fahrenheit, doesn't matter. 100 million degrees. Y-axis, you need to be dense. You need to get enough of it. And you need to insulate it well enough, otherwise it takes too much heat to run. If you do those three things, hot, dense, and insulated, you get to the upper right of this graph, and those curves in the upper right are what nature gave us. Those curves are where you start to make more power from the fusion reaction than it took to get there. And all these dots are all machines that have been built around the world, mostly by governments, that have peer-reviewed, demonstrated these conditions. And we've marched up faster than Moore's law. And that blue dot is the first time that humans have made more energy out from a fusion reaction than they put in. That was done at a laser in California about 18 months ago. That orange dot is the machine that we're building right now. It's predicted to make 10 times more power out than in at industrial scale. So the science is now at the stage where we understand what we're doing. Compute and other, other parts of the science have caught up. So what we are doing is we're building this. This is a picture, not a render, of Spark. This is probably one of the most advanced energy projects in the world. This is a multi-billion dollar project, an hour outside of Boston on an army base that we bought. And three years ago, this was a forest. That's a building, and the middle of that building is where the fusion machine goes. And around that are all the different accoutrements, all the different subsystems that are adapted from other industries to make the fusion machine run. We're about two years away from pushing the button and turning this on. Here's some pictures. This is the campus. That's a factory. I'll show you where we make the machine. That's the facility. And you get a sense of like, it's industrial scale. This is about 70% the scale of a full power plant. It's got technologies in it that are borrowed from other things, like LNG refrigerators, but colder, 20 degrees above absolute zero vacuum vessels that hold the fusion that are made by oil and gas suppliers that would normally be building like a Bessemer process. RF that's made off the same parts of fast charging and the Model S power inverter. And this right here is where we're getting ready to start to install the actual fusion machine. That's a spark on the wall to give you a sense of scale. So in two years, this will have a machine there, we'll push a button and we'll make a whole bunch of fusion power from almost no fuel uh, at many times power out over N. This is the factory that makes that machine. This is a factory, every piece of this is technology that we've invented over the last three years that makes superconducting magnets that are twice the magnetic field that we had access to three years ago. Made out of materials that are, made, won the Nobel Prize. And this is an example of like the exponential view of all these technologies coming together and reinforcing each other. So in this factory, it makes the various pieces of the magnets, it tests them, and it runs 24 hours a day. 18 months ago, this was a dirt floor. 
And so at CFS, we're pulling together these technologies and these people, because in order to meet the demands that we have, we, ca we can't just, you know, make fusion scientists, we actually have to take other people from other industries and put them all together. So this is, these systems are made by people that build rockets, they're made by people that build cars, they're made by people that build ships, they're made by people that build vaccine factories and pharmaceutical factories. And we're now thinking about that first power plant. So two years away from our demonstration, this is a picture of a site in, uh, outside of Richmond, Virginia in a partnership with Dominion, the, one of the large U.S. utilities, and that's where we're going to build ARC. We announced that in December. We're also signing up the offtake for these power plants, so that the goal is when we turn Spark on in two years, we have not just that, but the factories to make it, the site for the commercial plant, the offtake for the commercial plant, and the team to go execute that. And that's at the very beginning of an exponential curve. It'll take a long time to, to reach those big curves that I showed earlier, but you have to start somewhere and you have to start with a foundation that can scale. And when you think about what this could mean, like this is really exponential thinking. This is like, what could you do without constraints, right? Without energy constraints, without constraints about how industries work today, without constraints about how things are developed. And I, I hope that CFS and Fusion Broadly like, can set a very far edge on that thinking. And so uh, watch for the next uh, 30 months or so as we turn this on. Thanks.